Core, Aluminum Company of America. The nation's leading producer of aluminum presents an exciting headline game, It's News to Me. Some men went in this week to get this object out. Do you know the story? Do you know why this man said he was not going to get worked up into a lather this week? A group of Americans crossed the line this week to get these flowers. Do you know the story? Here to tangle with these questions and many more are Quentin Reynolds, famous author, commentator, and editor of United Nations World. June Lockhart, bright young star of stage and screen. John Henry Ford. Raconteur, lecturer, and humorist. Our own delightful Annaline. And your host of It's News to Me, news correspondent and commentator, John Daly. Thank you, good evening, and welcome to It's News to Me. Tonight, once again, we're going to watch our panel answer news questions when they can, make up answers when they have to. And our experts will play against contestants chosen from the studio, so may we have our first contestant, please. <laughs> Let's see, this is Mrs. Nancy Taylor. Where are you from, Mrs. Taylor? I live in Virginia. You do now? Well, I've never known it unless you... No, me. I learned to talk in Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> well, you come on a bit closer. You learned to talk in Georgia. Uh, yes. And they let you live in Virginia when you learned to talk in Georgia. Well, you have to learn to say host instead of hire. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you're as expert about things in the news because you've got a tough job to do. You've got to judge the answers of the panel here to questions I ask of them related to the news. You've got to decide whether their answers are right or wrong. Now, our experts over here will answer correctly if they can, but you've got to watch out because if they cannot, They'll make up an answer and try to bluff you, you see? I cross all their fingers for you. Now, here are the $20 with which you play the game. Good. Isn't I? Yeah. And every time your judgment's correct, I give you another $5. And every time it is incorrect, I will take $5 away. I'm sorry. You are ready for your first question? Yeah, I hope. All right. Our friends on the panel a moment ago had a chance to examine these red and white flowers. Now, you can look at them. Mm. Hmm? No bees, no nothing. No see? Problem. Now, the trick comes later. Now, it took a lot of pull in Europe this week for some American sailors to get these flowers. You know the story, uh, Anna Lee? Well, Mrs. Taylor, it, it seems it's an old Helsinki custom to present the winners of the Olympic Games with red and white carnations. And when the uh, Navy crew won the crew event at uh, Helsinki the other day, uh, they came up one by one, and each one of them was presented with a big bouquet of carnations. It was kind of funny, presenting them to men. And, of course, there were a lot of them, and by the time they'd finished, it looked like the uh, first night at the Metropolitan Opera House. Do you accept that answer, Mrs. Taylor? Uh, hmm? No, I think she's telling a story. You think she's oh, telling a story? Taylor. Well, that's a story that's going to cost you $5. I'm awful sorry. Like a lot. No, no. <laughs> I, must, I must say this. I must say that Miss Anna, Miss Anna told that one with enough hesitancy that uh, I think I'd have thought it wasn't true, too, if I hadn't known it was. But actually, this is an Olympic victory bouquet. Twenty red and white carnations given to the winners of each event. And this week, as Miss Lee told you, the U.S. Navy crew won a spectacular first each member was given one. Now, as you can see from the picture on our screen, that's uh, quite a good, hale and hearty bunch of boys. <laughs> now, Scandinavian Air Service flew these flowers from Helsinki in time to be shown to you all this evening. And incidentally, Scandinavian Air Service also flew these pink carnations, which go to the second place winners, and these bronze carnations, which go to the third place winners. And a fourth place winner, I guess he gets a skunk cabbage, but we didn't have any flown to us. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure, we did. The flowers of the skunk cabbage. Well, let's see what we can do with another one. You're only the first okay. one. You've got nothing to worry about. And for this next question, let's watch and listen to Frank Vane as a German Burgermeister. Doesn't Olga make a beautiful bride? This is so romantic. She is from Leipzig in the Russian zone, and he is from the Allied sector of Berlin. Even the Iron Curtain could not stop this marriage. <laughs> Look at her. 
She is wearing something old, something new, something borrowed, or something blue. And I am, for Olga, the bridal garter. Frank Wayne makes this sound like a very happy wedding indeed. Perhaps you can tell us the story, Quentin Rudd. <laughs> well, it's a very simple story. I don't even know why it got any publicity, because it happens every day. It's just the old story of boy meets girl, and boy wins girl. The girl's name was Olga, and she lived in Leipzig, and the boy's name, I forget, but he lived <laughs> in the zoo in the Berlin, off part of Berlin. And they decided, the Russians did, that they'd like to have Olga meet our American boyfriend in the Berlin sector. So after an awful lot of trouble of travel permits and things like that, they arranged for the boy, who was a hippopotamus, by the way, to go over to Leipzig to meet Olga the girl hippopotamus. And the Russians were very nice for once about it, and they presented Olga with that uh, bridal daughter. And I guess it's the first time the Russians have admitted that we have anything they really needed. <laughs> Do you accept that answer, Mrs. Taylor? Sounds too good to be true, but I guess so. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? Oh, brother, now <laughs> I'm... Right. Now I'm high stood up. Actually, I'm Let going me, to... She come over here. That's right. There's, there's one difference. Actually, Olga came from East Germany to West Germany. That's a small yeah, point, so we say you win. Mrs. Taylor is absolutely right. Nobody can make up a hippopotamus. And that's Quentin had right, so we'll say that you won that one. All right, let's see what we can do now. By the way, the male hippo's name was Kanowski. Yeah. What do you know? <laughs> what does Kanowski can't remember? Okay. Question number three. It was news this week when a New Jersey expert on figures let a Los Angeles amateur know that he was not interested in new shapes. You know the story, John mm -hmm. Henry Falk. Yes, that's the mayor. That's the big hassle they had with, the, not the mayor, but the chairman of the bathing beauty contest in Atlantic City, New Jersey, who was approached by a group in Los Angeles. We want to pull off a bathing beauty contest, uh, the semi-annual. See, they have the annual bathing beauty contest in New Jersey. They want to pull off a semi-annual out there. And this gentleman in Atlantic City, who is quite an authority on figures, having looked at a considerable number of them every year, turned thumbs down on it, says they weren't interested. It was Atlantic City's and Atlantic City's only. You accept that answer, Mrs. Taylor? Mm -hmm. You do. That will cost to you a five dollars. Oh. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like you, that red-headed so lady from Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> well, he does. He talks awful fast, so he's from Texas, you know. Uh, you gotta I've watch got ten folks in Georgia, Actually, though, honey, and I wouldn't have done it <laughs> if I know the right answer. Does anybody, know the, one, doesn't he, Mrs. anybody know the right answer to this one? This was one of the big stories of the week. The expert on figures is Dr. Albert Einstein. He wrote to the Reverend Louis A. Gardner of Los Angeles in answer to a query as to what the uh, learned right, doctor right, thought about right, flying right, saucers. Right. Yeah, right. And he thanks, them, but ain't interested. thanks to the Reverend Gardner, I have that letter here in my hand. If you look up at our oh. screen there, you can see it enlarged with Dr. Einstein's signature. And the letter reads, Dear Sir, those people have seen something. What it is, I do not know, and I am not curious to know. <laughs> Sincerely yours, A. Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, and now here to yeah. tell us some facts about the current fuss over flying saucers is Mr. James Ritchie of the Civil Aeronautics Authority, who was one of the men who first spotted and plotted the so-called saucers on radar at the Washington airport. Will you come out, please, Mr. Ritchie? <laughs> now, just so we understand each other, what do you folks who are professionals call these things which at least are described as flying saucers? Uh, we call these things unidentified objects. <laughs> I see. From my understanding, the Air Force calls them indeterminate masses. Indeterminate masses and unidentified objects. Well, uh, I know that you, sitting in your radar room, which I understand is deep underground, or at least underground, you don't see the sky, have plotted these um, indeterminate masses, unidentified objects, uh, flying saucers, I should not mention the word, uh, on your scopes. And I also know that uh, you've seen a great many of them that you brought in commercial pilots. What has actually happened? Well, we've seen quite a few of them, John, uh, probably well over a hundred. We've seen these unidentified objects on our scopes. And uh, all in all, we've had 24 uh, times where the pilot flew to where we told him there was a, a pip he would request that he would be vectored to it. We'd vector him over to it. 24 different times lights were seen. 
We had asked him to describe the light, describe the object, and uh, he would either say it was a white light, most of them said white light, one pilot said it was yellow and it would go to red and back to yellow. We asked him to describe it. He said the only description he could give is it's very attractive. Uh huh. Now the pilot saw two that he said were blue. So we've had them pretty well described in all different ways. Well, now, I read that uh, one, not your people, but the people in the Washington Tower felt that they had tracked one of these things for eight seconds and, and uh, determined that the speed was about 7,200 miles an hour, which, of course, sounds fantastic. What, uh, in your experience, what is your experience with the alleged speed of these unidentified masses? Well, of course, we in the Washington Air Traffic Control Center have different type radar than that which is in the tower. And... Uh, we track, most that we track, were going anywhere from 40 miles an hour to 90 miles an hour. On occasions, they were going 200, but normally, just uh, 40 to 90. 40 to 90 miles an hour. That's correct, sir. Now, I know you called in the military, the Air Force people sometimes. What do the Air Force people do when they got up there with the jets and these lights? That well, we would, them to? we would vector the Air Force people, the jets, to the saucers as they appeared on our scope. They would go after them. And uh, they didn't seem to be able to make any enclosure on it. They would go down at the target, they would see a white light, and the target would pull away from them or disappear. Now, they would see what they thought was a white light. Uh, well, now, what, what do you think about these, uh, these dinguses that you see on your scope? That's a good question, John. It is. <laughs> well, uh, yes. <laughs> well, it's been nice to see you, too. Thank you. Oh. Awfully good of you to come and visit us. I love it. Well, you're going to be happy if we just consider these unidentified objects or indefinite masses, is that it? That's right. And it was nice of you to come up and tell us what you've experienced personally anyway. Good night. Right. Good to see you. All right, now for our next question, let's take a look at our screen. The man that you see there getting a quick trim made plans this week to do some trimming on his own before very long. <coughs> Suppose you give us the story, June Lockhart. Oh, that, uh person having a quick trim is um, Howard Hughes and the quick trim he's speaking of. He's going to trim his uh, employee, his staff of employees at RKO Studios because the uh, television industry has made such inroads into the uh, revenue of uh, motion picture business that he's had to cut his staff down to a skeleton crew and from now on he's just going to use them to make A pictures in Technicolor. You accept this answer, Mrs. Taylor? No. You don't. That That's doesn't look like Howard. That doesn't look like Howard Hughes. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> that makes you five dollars richer. Here. <laughs> Johnny Four. <laughs> That's Governor Adlai Stevenson. Right, Democratic. Governor. Governor Adlai Stevenson. President. Democratic candidate for president, as you can see now, if you'll take another look at our screen. He held his first big press conference this week since the convention, told reporters that he was no longer a reluctant candidate He's appointed a campaign manager, and he's held several meetings. He's ready to get into high gear to try and win the election victory for the Democrats. And now a look at our scoring tells us that you won from the Aluminum Company of America $20. Thanks Thank for being a guest. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> bye bye. And now, we have our next studio representative on its news to me. How are you, sir? Come on in and sit you down. This is Mr. Ernest Fisiel. Hmm? Fizzy Alley. You heard, uh, heard me explain the rules for the game, Mr. Of course. Yes. Here are the $20 with which you play. Thank you. You all ready for your first question? I am. Good. Here it is. For this question, I'd like all of you to take a look at this object. Eh? It was the first thing out of a building this week when a fire was started in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Suppose you tell us the story, Anna Lee. Oh, you remember, Mr. Spigelli, that explosion that occurred in the Sperry Gyroscope plant the other day in Bethlehem. Well, this was a very highly important piece of mechanism. I I'm going to get into deep water because it's very technical and I probably shan't describe it right, but it was a high-pressure gauge for testing the accuracy of a bomb site. And the chief engineer, I believe, I can't remember his name, but he risked his life in bringing this piece out. You accept that answer, Mr. Spigelli? Well, according to my daughter, Judy, who, uh, Anna Lee is the mother of a Judy story, I'd say no. You'd say no. <laughs> well, very yeah. smart man. Makes you five dollars richer. There's <laughs> <laughs> nothing to do with it. Very good. Actually, this is a piece of steel cut from the first beam rolled at the Bethlehem Steel Corporation plant following the end of the 53-day steel strike. 
Please. I know. <laughs> All right, now our newsman's question of the week, and this one is from Robert Lanigan of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. In Europe this week, it was news when an American diplomat turned down an invitation to a big show because he didn't like the advance notices. You know the story, Quentin Randall? Yes, that involved Walter Gifford, our ambassador to England. Last week, uh, you'll recall that the Labour Party, after uh, the House, the House of Commons, had ratified the bond agreements which we signed with France and with England, uh, the Labour Party repudiated them and said that let the Conservative Party sign them. They didn't want any part of it. Well, Gifford, that very same day, was invited to a Labour Party, their annual Labour Party, a party that they had. <laughs> and the Gifford, pretty annoyed at the attitude of the Labour Party over our signing the bond agreements, declined to attend, thus precipitating a very minor diplomatic incident. You accept that answer, Mr. Spazielli? I think Mr. Reynolds is right. You, you think he is? Well, I'm glad you feel he is, because it's going to cost you five dollars, and I only hope that it's worth it when it's all over. I'm sorry. <laughs> Actually, uh, we got the ambassador. Well, as a newspaper department. man, I figured he'd be right. Well, you oh, know, I thought I was right. <laughs> Sounded very convincing. Actually, it was America's ambassador to Russia, George F. Kennan, who snubbed an invitation to Soviet Air Force Day ceremonies in Moscow because of an anti-American poster used to advertise the event. The posters showed three red planes forcing down American planes. The British and the French envoys, by the way, also stayed home in protest. But Premier Stalin showed up, and from all accounts, he had a great time for himself. <laughs> all right, for our next question, let's watch and listen to this farewell scene. Fellow workers and a steady sanitation, street sweeping apartment. You have chose me, Clive Stone Schultz, a your representative to the great city of London. The dust shovel will never leave my side. I will carry with honor the broom endorsed by all ears. And as I go forth to England on this great mission, I repeat once again our mighty slogan. A tasket, a tasket, you should please throw it in the basket. <laughs> <laughs> Great way to deserve the applause for that one. And a mighty slogan he's laid down indeed. Suppose you make a clean sweep of things and tell us the story, John Henry Falk. First of all, I want to say Frank Wayne is my nomination for Academy Award. Definitely. Yes. Secondly, I want to say that that must have to do with the fact that a member of the House of Parliament, the Parliament over in England, got up and said New York just impressed him as such a clean place and wanted some kind of question, uh, answer from us. How do you keep the streets so clean? They have a big litter problem over there. How do you keep them from littering? And our official over here in New York in charge of such matters said, basket. And <laughs> I don't know whether they're going to send a delegate over there or not. I don't know whether Frank is going as a delegate, but I know it has to do with that story. Do you accept that answer, Mr. Spezioli? I think I will. I think you'd better. It makes you fire out of the world. <laughs> Actually, a member of the House of Commons wrote to the... Uh, head of the sanitation department in New York City and was advised that baskets would solve the problem, and London said, thank you. You had all the that details right. I thought about it before. No <laughs> delegates, <laughs> though, Johnny. All right, question number four, and for this question, everybody take a look at our screen. There you see Sergeant John E. Boitnot and his man Friday. They made news in Korea this week because of a very unusual triangle. Can you tell us the story, June Lockhart? Yes. The uh, private is uh, private. Friday, and uh, he was used by the sergeant as a human decoy to uh, detect communist snipers. And the way they did it was this. Uh, the uh, private went out into the middle of an open field and ran around a while, and uh, then he would call out, Yoo-hoo, here I am over here, and thus draw the fire of a communist sniper. So he would, the, the sniper would shoot at the private, thus uh, showing where he was, where the sniper was hiding, so that the sergeant could in turn shoot at the sniper and kill him. And they kept this up until they had uh, nine communist snipers all together. And of course, the reason that uh, Private Friday agreed to do it was that he was sure the communists couldn't possibly hit a moving target. 
You accept this answer, Mr. Spazio? I like Miss June Lockhart, but I think she's kidding me, so I'll say no. You'll say no. That'll cost you five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Men always follow your heart. Always follow your heart. Absolutely right. The story is complete as it was told by Miss Lockhart, and the company commander found out about what the two were doing, and he put a stop to it. He thought this was a pretty risky way of doing things. Now, look at our scoring tells us that you have won from the Aluminum Company of America. $20. Thanks Thank you for coming to see us. Thank you very much, Ken. Bye-bye. And now, it's time to meet tonight's eyewitness, the person who actually saw a famous news event take place. Panel, let's see how fast you can uncover the event by cross-examining our guest. You may question for 15 seconds at a time, but when the time bell sounds like this, the next panelist takes up the questioning. If you beat our eyewitness and guess his news story within two minutes, I'm only going to give you two minutes tonight, he will receive $50. If you don't guess the news story within this time limit, our guest beats you, and he will receive $100. Now it's time to meet tonight's eyewitness, Mr. Frank F. Tuckerman. Mr. Tuckerman, how are you? If you will just at this point tell us the month and the day of the news event at which you were eyewitness. May 6th. Now before we get started, let's let our home audience know the event. But panel, you have the month and the day, May 6th. You should be ready for the questioning. You, Quentin Reynolds, start now. Does this have to do with World War I? Nothing. World War II? No. Nothing to do with war at all? Was it of a political nature? No. Does it happen in the 1940s? No. In the 1920s? No. All right. In the 1930s? 30s. In the 1930s. Uh, did it happen in the Eastern Hemisphere? It did. Uh, in Europe? Western Hemisphere. Western Hemisphere. In Western Hemisphere. Thank did it happen in the United States of America? It did. Did it happen on the eastern half of the United States? Yeah. All right. Mr. Did Paul. it involve a lot of people? Quite a number of was people. Was it of a disaster nature? Or it was. It was a disaster then. Was it from natural causes? Who knows? Train wreck? No. Plane wreck? No. Did, did, did it happen in the air? Did it happen in New Jersey? Was it the oh. burning of the Hindenburg? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> May 6th. Uh, I remember that date. It was near the coronation. That's right. May 6th, 1937, and the Hindenburg disaster. Mr. Tuckerman, would you tell us how you happen to be an eyewitness? Well, I'm in the uh, United States Customs Service in, in Philadelphia, and uh, Lakehurst is in our district. So uh, I was part of the boarding party that were waiting on the land to her on the ground to board the ship as soon as it uh, was made fast to the mooring mast. But she literally must have blown up blown in up before right your in eyes. Face. That's right. I see. I think that probably that great disaster and a very unhappy event has set back lighter than aircraft for, well, heaven knows how long, don't you? Well, it probably has, yes. Well, Mr. Tuckerman, I'm afraid we didn't give our friends too much trouble, but it certainly was good of you to come and join us on its news to me. Nice Thanks. to see you. And now may we have another audience representative on its news to me. Sailor, how are you? Come on in and sit you down now. This is able-bodied seaman Edward Tyrell, right? Avi aviation boatsman. Aviation boatsman. I can get A-B mixed up, can't I? Is, is I get your last name right, Tyrell? Tyrell. All right, you know how we play this game, don't you, sir? Well, Here are the $20 with which you play. Are you all ready for your first question? <laughs> okay, this week in Maryland, a man got himself on the blacklist for putting things down in black and white. Can you tell us the story, John Henry Ford? Yes, it refers to the story of General Grow, who wrote, uh, who was court-martialed at Fort Meade, wasn't it, Maryland, this past week for having let his, his, having let his diary fall into the hands of the Russians. I see. And a, uh, uh, Mr. Tyrell, <laughs> would you accept that answer? Yes, I do. You would accept that answer. Hmm. Makes you five dollars rich. Now, I'll tell you what. I just had a look at the clock. And I'm very unhappy to tell you that we don't have time to ask you the three other questions. So we can do nothing but assume that you knew the answers to all three of them <laughs> and just pay you for them. That looks like you have won from the Aluminum Company of America $20. And thanks very much for being our guest. Good to see you. One of these nights, I'm going to show up on this program when there's no time left. <laughs> I promise you that. A panel, you did very well tonight. Must say you were brilliant, both when you were telling the truth and when you were making the answers up. And now, we wind up proceedings on tonight's session of It's News to Me. We hope the program has proved enjoyable and that it has sharpened your interest in the news. This is John Daly saying good night for Anna Lee, John Henry Falk, June Lockhart, and Quentin Reynolds.
And we certainly hope to see you all again next week on It's News to Me. It's News to Me has been presented by Alcon, Aluminum Company of America. This has been a Mark Goodson, Bill Godman production. <laughs> Produced in association with the CBS Television Network.